Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. Um, as you know, I have over the years by accident become a mold expert. And so a lot of my shows, I get to talk to experts in the field. And today is no different. Um, I will introduce Brian Carr formally to you in just a moment. But I do want to just say we were just discussing how long ago did we meet and, and where was it? And it was uh, probably four or five years ago at one of the conferences. And I just had always had respect for these guys at the Mold Finders because I felt like they were really, um, number one, they wanted to understand the patient experience as well. And I would say 95% of people in this field of mold remediation don't really know uh, much about the mold effect on the human body and the suffering that my patients go through. And as you well know, Brian, we'll talk about this today, many people who are suffering from mold are the canaries. So there might be three people in the home that are like, I'm fine. And there's one person who's incredibly sick. So this um, toxin and the toxins it produces mold in general affect people very differently. So it helps us as clinicians and um, the patients to have people like you who are in the field um, helping us find the problems um, that really understand how much this can affect human health and really understand to the level sometimes of how we need the cleans and you know that kind of remediation done. Um, yeah. Let me introduce you, and then we'll dive into the conversation. Um, just background, if you guys want to find other episodes, you can find me at uh, jillcarnahan.com. Um, you can find products at drjillhealth.com. And you can find all of my episodes, I think we're on number 90-something, uh, at my YouTube channel, just under my name. And you can also find this on anywhere that podcasts are played, like iTunes. So um, if you have want to look at some other episodes, they're all there. So Brian Carr, my guest today, is a second generation indoor air environmental consultant who specializes in working, as we said, with hypersensitive individuals with complex medical conditions. So many of you listening um, are grateful for people like him that we have to help us. He helps them understand if mold, mycotoxins, or other indoor pathogens exist in their homes and may, contri may be contributing to their health conditions and then how to remedy these issues. Brian, I'm just going to stop there just for a second and say, I can do what I do all day long, but the big factor is having people like you that are helping the patients find the problem. Because as I've said so many times before, until the patients get out of that exposure or remediate or fix the problem, I can give all the supplements, IVs, things in the world, and it won't change unless their environment is clean enough for them to get well. So we are so grateful for people like you. Um, Brian really has been a go-to mold and biotoxin resource. And if you aren't following him on Instagram, Mold Binders, he is a great resource. I love the content you're putting out. Such a fan. Thank you. Uh, again, Thank because you. <laughs> I feel like I need someone like, you know, we need each other. And I'm just so grateful to have people out there like you giving really accurate, good information about mold and how it affects the health. And as we're going to talk about today, the hidden, um, you know, sources of mold in your home or the hidden problem that you might not even know about, many people are completely oblivious until their health goes downhill and they're like, what's going on? Um, Brian's become a go-to resource, like we said, for many medical practitioners like myself across the country. And he's helped over 3,000 hypersensitive individuals nationwide, national -wide, nationwide to create healthier living environments. Um, so Brian, how did you get into this? And tell us a little bit about your story. Ah, uh, it's funny. I'll tell you, I didn't go to school to go look around for mold in people's houses. That's definitely not. Yeah. Something. <laughs> um, but you know what? I my story, I'll, I'll keep it somewhat short because it, it can extend out. But like, I had my own issue, like a lot of people do, that get into this area. And for me, I um I was I was sitting in my room. I'd just been laid off of a advertising job in the uh, 2008 sort of financial crisis thing that happened, and mm -hmm. I'm, like looking for a job on my computer. And I I feel something like on my arm, right? I feel like this thing, and I look up to the ceiling, and and my ceiling was dripping oh on my. Me. And, and I could actually see the stain. The stain was like, like building as I was like, I was like, holy crap, this thing is going to fall on me right now. Wow. <laughs> and it kind of did. Like I dove out, I grabbed my computer, dove out of my bed and the ceiling like collapsed essentially. Wow. Water's coming through the ceiling. It's an apartment. There's a pipe leak up there. Anyways, so fast forward, call the landlord, freaking out. Something's going on. You got to get this fixed. So what do they do? They send somebody over to fix the pipe leak, and that's pretty much all that they did. Yeah. And um, and they're like, okay, everything's cool. You know, we dried everything out. You're fine. Whatever. And you know, this is for a lot of people. Like, you put trust in these people. You know, like, oh, they manage buildings. They must know. Oh, they said it's fine. It must be fine. I was no different, right? This is one thing I was kind of say to folks is like, you know, 
I may talk a lot and ramble on and whatever, whatever, but like at one point in time, I was just like you, like I wasn't any different. Right. And like, you could learn this stuff. And um, anyway, so I start kind of noticing the first hit for me was cognition hit. I started realizing that like, I wasn't able to remember things as easily. I was a little slower. I wasn't as sharp as I normally was. And then like the kicker for me is I wake up one day and I start seeing like red patches, like on my face, like I was, I was getting like eczema or psoriasis type of things that were going on. So that was kind of the big kicker for me. Now, the, the thing that got me into this is that I was my, who's my wife now, I was dating her at the time. Her dad, who uh, is now my father-in-law is literally one of the top guys that does this in the country. Wow. Um, and, uh, and she's like, you should call my dad. These things sound similar to people that yeah. he, he works with or whatever. And honestly, I was like super hesitant. I, I just started dating her. I'm like, eh, I don't want this to be the way I meet your dad and whatever. Eventually I end up caving. I have him come. And it's interesting because the landlord has sent somebody because I was complaining beforehand. They sent some local mold inspector guy to come in. I mean, you could guess what he did. He came in, took an air sample in my yep. room, took one you know, over here and he was out within 20, 30 minutes. Mark, who is, so my, my father-in-law is Mark Levy, uh, uh, he spent two hours in an 800 square foot apartment, um, found eight different things that were going on, some not even in my room, some in other places, and, and uh, essentially helped me kind of get out of that situation, navigate how to get out of the lease and like all this stuff. And at that point, still didn't have a job yet. And I immediately, like right after this whole thing in, I was like, I need to, I need to do this. Like, I want to work for you right now. Like I'll work for you. Let's do this. And he, um, he, he, he bet. And there you go. That's how it happened. Oh, I love it. I love it because you know what, you know, you probably know my story. I was in an office that had flooded during the 2013 floods. It already had issues. Cause I was over, you could laugh at some of these things. So my office was on the second story, right above an un, uh, crawl space that had standing water. And then the floods <laughs> happened in two door, two levels down in the basement and standing water. And there was stacky wow. batteries bulk all over the place, plus the crawl space. And then my office had been remodeled and my contractor, I don't know what he was thinking, came in and said, let's take this old 20 year old carpet and just throw in, throw on bamboo on top of it. So they just uh, threw bamboo flooring right on top of this old nasty carpet that was right over in a crawl space that was not okay at all. And uh, of course, every time I walked, it would the soft bamboo would puff that gross carpet. That carpet was probably loaded with mold. Oh my god! And then so like the whole thing was like I, I look back now I'm like oh if I had only known. And I got really <laughs> sick like you the cognition the skin stuff and started noticing issues and um, I finally went down to the basement, got a box sample, clearly stacky batteries everywhere. And then also my urine was loaded with trichosethenes, which are from stacky. So that was all the evidence I needed. And I moved out and never went back. So totally get it. But I didn't know a thing. And same thing, the landlord I went to and I said, this is an issue. I'm getting sick. They wouldn't do anything. So I had to leave. I had to actually leave and break my lease and we made it right. But it was, uh, my health was more important than the money, right? <laughs> Can I just say one thing on breaking leases? Because a lot of times people will be like, oh, I'm stuck. I'm in a mm -hmm. lease. Yeah. I can't get out. Listen, contracts are meant to be broken. Contracts, they are. They just are, right? There's loopholes. There's things you can do. There's ways you can do it. They'll try to make you think that you can't get out of it. All it took for me was a threatening letter from an attorney that said I was going to sue them. All of a sudden, the contract didn't mean anything. All of a sudden, they like let me go because they don't want to deal with it. There's ways to get around this. So don't feel like you're so trapped like by this contract that you can't get out of. Brian, I love that you're saying that because I get contacted a lot to be an expert witness in legal cases and different things. I try to avoid the, I am not a legal testifier. Like that's not my area. It's too stressful. I'd rather yeah. help the patient and let someone who's an expert in kind of a, I don't know if you know Enneagram, but eights on the Enneagram are those confrontational kind of, they're good at that. I am not. <laughs> so again, yeah. um, but back to the um, helping patients is there are ways, even your doctor, I have had patients where I've written a note, you know, we have these labs with this health condition. I don't think this is a good environment. And even though I'm not an attorney that has carried enough weight to often get them out of the lease as well. So do, if you're listening out there and you're stuck, um, these things are so tricky because they involve usually your home or your workplace. And it usually, whether it's remediation or moving or breaking a lease, it's financially, there's consequences and it can be hard. So not to say that it's easy, but don't feel threatened or trapped because your health is the most valuable asset that you have. So I love that you said that, Brian. Yeah. And think of it this way, like it's a financial thing for you. It's also one for that, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not just one side of the fence. Like think of it from their point of view. They're like, okay, I got someone in here who's probably going to raise a stink. Uh, I might have to get my attorney involved to pay my yeah. attorney fees. Oh, what if I have to remediate this one wall over here? Right. I this one wall. 
Like their buildings, I, I went through this whole course on how to like invest in real estate and how they do the math and they do all the formulations and stuff. I mean, if you're in an apartment building, let's say, they're, they calculate based on how many doors are in the building and they're trying to turn a profit of like a few hundred bucks per door, right? So if you come in, you're like, oh, by the way, this is gonna cost like $2,000 to fix this. You've killed their profit margin across five doors basically yeah. for a year. They don't want you in there. They'd rather get you out and move somebody in there, right? So like for them, it's beneficial too. Yeah, I totally agree. And again, having a conversation human to human, and they don't always listen, but you can start with really practical, just, hey, here's the situation, you know, I need your help. And surprisingly, a lot of times you can get a lot of traction that way. Um, yeah. So I love that you're, like I said, back in the beginning, the story in my story, it's it's really, it's probably why we're two of the most passionate people on Instagram, right? <laughs> because, um, because it really does matter. And we saw the detriment to our own health. And I'm assuming yeah. you got back your health once you got out of there and everything. And I did too, for the most yeah, part. Yeah, I mean, I'm still dealing with it because I then was going into everyone's house who was a big oh, yeah. problem for years and years and years after that. So my, I was like tricking my oh, body. no. <laughs> I part-time lived in a really moldy place. So oh. I'm, I'm, I have like gut things that I'm still trying to figure out at the end. Well, of we'll it. have to talk after the call. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> cool. Oh, so let's go. So the biggest thing I think that you brought to our title and to the topic today is I think there's a lot of people out there. A lot of my listeners have mold, know about mold, whatever. But if you're listening and you're like, whatever, this doesn't have anything to do with me. What are some hidden signs or things that you, these people might be um, noticing either their health or their home that might indicate a mold problem that they wouldn't necessarily know about? Yeah. You know, I joke about this all the time, but it's like so true. It's the, the, the secret to going in and finding mold in a house is to not actually look for mold in the house. Like if you do that, you're on the right path because you can't really see it. Like very yes. rarely is it able to be seen. The secret to doing this is to look for signs of water damage mm -hmm. and not stuff that's wet right now, right? Although that's a problem, but most times that we go into a place the moisture readers are dry. The infrared cameras don't show anything. It's because the problem happened before and it's dried at this point. So the biggest misconception that people have is that I need to have a water problem right now for there to be a mold problem. It's completely the opposite from that. And I mean, just think of it this way. Imagine you had like this big, beautiful yard that you had and then you stopped watering. Like does the water, does the grass just pick up and walk away and go somewhere yeah. else? No, it dries out. It becomes brittle. It breaks apart if you play with the, if you, you know, with the blades and that's exactly what happens with mole colonies. So that's the concept. Like imagine that happening in your house. So the way that you, that you kind of figure out what's going on, the very, very, very first thing that you do in the first conversation I have with every client when we talk, talking about the history of this house. Yes. Has there been any previous water issues? I'm not talking floods. Like if there's been a flood, sure. Tell me about the floods. That's great. We need to know about that. Was there a drip under your sink one time randomly that you just like, oh, we just fixed the faucet and it stopped. Mm -hmm. Were your kids splashing out of the bathtub for like three weeks straight and before you got them in line? Let's talk about that. Talk about these little things that happen that we normalize as being normal in a house because we were never taught as kids growing up that these things in a house are a problem, yeah. right? Yeah. We were always taught like, oh, you do this, you let it dry. The, the flip side of that is when you like got your first car, I'm sure your parents were like, you better put oil in this car. Otherwise there's a problem. Like my dad told me if I didn't put oil in my car, my car would explode. So you better believe that I put oil in my car every 3000 miles. That car, my very first car was like a $5,000 car or something. People's homes yeah. are a hundred times that. Yeah. And we've never learned these little maintenance things that you need to keep an eye on in the house. It's no one's fault. It's just what it is. So if you take nothing else away from this, other than this one thing, there doesn't need to be water right now. And if you look anywhere and you see some of the things that we'll talk about here in a minute, these signs that you talk about, there's a really, really high likelihood that there's a mold problem back there. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk. And I love that because again, I'm a clinician, but I'm also being detective and I want to know if I need to refer them to someone like you. So I'm asking the same things. If I just said, is there mold in your house? 99% would say no. Right. And we move on. So I never ask right. that question. I'm asking, <laughs> has your washer ever leaked? Does the dishwasher ever leak? Does your floor buckle when you walk on it? Is there any, you know, signs that, yeah, your cabinets, uh, showers, you know, um, all these things as a grout, is it cracking? So little things that do make a difference. And there's many more questions. Um, and those are the signs, uh, that will often lead to something that is an issue. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, go ahead and tell us about kind of the hidden things that you might, besides just the obvious, like you said, no, not necessarily seeing mold. 
Yeah. So it's, it, it honestly breaks down to five things. Like I, I, we went through everything that we went through all the inspections we done. We created a, a, a training program on how to find mold in your homes. And so while I was doing that, I was like, okay, we got to figure this out. But it all stemmed from a previous client that I had who was, she was in LA, she was moving to Hawaii. And she's like, Brian, I want to fly you out to Hawaii. I don't trust anyone else to look through this house. I'll take care of everything. I'll give you a week here. I'll put you up. Like, I need you to do this, which normally like who would say no to that? But my, my wife was pregnant. I was like, I can't leave my pregnant wife here and go gallivant around Hawaii for a while. So, um, so basically I was like, listen, I can't do that. So why don't you do this? Why don't you just sort of tell me the rooms that are in your house? Don't even like blueprint it for me. Just have this many bedrooms, this many, this, this many, just tell me that. And I'll try to write something up for you. Basically, I was going to try to like take what I do and sort yeah. of put it on a piece of paper for her to kind of go through, right? So she does this for me. I basically write down these things to look for. And then I went through old inspections and found some pictures she could reference and stuff and, and to do that. So she goes to this house. I had done two other inspections for her. Like she's seen, she's seen it. It's not like this is new to her. She was in escrow, goes through the house. She's like, oh my God. She's like, this place is a disaster. How did I not know this? Wow. It gets out of it. And then I don't talk to her for a little bit after that. She follows up with me a couple months later. She's like, Brian, I, um, we, you know, we got out of that one house and then we went looking for some more. She's like, I literally took the same thing you gave me. It wasn't even specific to like the new houses. I just took what you gave me and I went through all the new houses. Yeah. And I weeded out three more houses and we found the house that was a good fit for me. Right. And it was a light bulb that went off. I was like, you know what? Like, well, yes, every house has its quirks and stuff. Every house, every apartment, it's basically the same thing. It's walls, floors, ceilings, cabinets, bedrooms, laundry rooms, bathrooms, kitchens. Like they all have the same stuff. Yeah. And the process that we do to inspect all of it, it's the same. Ultimately, mm -hmm. you're looking for the same stuff in the same places in every room. And so as I broke all that down, that's how we created the, the program ultimately, but I kind of realized there's really only five signs of hidden mold growth, right? These five signs of water damage. So one of them is uh, bubbling, whether it's paint mm -hmm. or like building materials. So think like if you open your sink cabinet under, you know, kitchen sink and you look under, it's kind of like bubbly, like you see like little bumps in there. That means that the cabinet's soaked in some moisture, right? If that's happened, then there's a likelihood that there's mold under the cabinet, right? And that's an example you can see bubbling in paint, you can see it in cabinetry and wood and things like that. Even guys, while we're talking cabinets, even product bottles that yeah. leak, okay? The main ingredient of product bottles is water yeah. with some little additive. I've had a kitchen sink in a place I was in, my wife bought this cleaning product, I didn't even know what it was, I opened the sink, something had exploded, Mm -hmm. I go back, pull it out, mold everywhere. I look at the bottle. It's a mold cleaning tile spray for your shower. Wow. Exploded mold all over my cabinet. Wow. Right. Yeah. Like they're all water-based. Uh -huh. right? so, so don't look at a ring and say, oh, that's a product ring. There's no mm -hmm. way that could be something that's not necessarily true. Yeah. So that's one. And, uh, the second one is cracking and peeling. So think um, think like chipping and flaking paint. That's like a good one, a good example of those that you might find. Um, sometimes you'll see cracking kind of breaking out from different materials that could also be a sign that water gets in. So peeling, chipping, cracking, that sort of thing. Uh, the next one is like buckling or separating. So think like floors will buckle and bow right if water gets in them. Baseboards, if you look at your baseboards, if you look at the top where they meet the wall and they're, you know, the grout kind of connects it to the wall, it's like smooth. And then all of a sudden, like one of them's like, like bowing out a little bit and you can see a little gap in between where the wall yeah. and the baseboard is. That could have been a moisture issue that caused that. Mm -hmm. Right. So those are like little things you look for. Um, the next one, buckling, like hardwood floors or, or laminate flooring, the buckling bowing too. Right. Yeah. So you could just like swipe your foot yeah. across the hard floor. And if you feel mm -hmm. it moving, like then, you know, right. So that's like an easy way to do it on floors. And that would happen more around areas, usually where there's plumbing stuff or where there's maybe near exterior walls or maybe water's coming in. That's kind of where those things would happen more often. Um, efflorescence or like mineral deposits. That's another thing. You mostly see this in like crawl spaces, basements, but like that white powdery stuff that you see on foundation walls, that means that water came through there, left a mineral deposit on the stone and it's there. So that means water has come in at some point in time. It doesn't mean it's happening right now, but that it's been there. 
Um, it can also be on like concrete in the basement or like coming up through, because I've seen that through concrete. I don't know, they have a special term in the flooring industry, but that um, it's almost like a, a, a calcium deposit, right? The minerals. Yeah, it's called efflorescence. It's okay. like the fancy name for it, okay. but it, it literally is just like a mineral deposit, Got right? So yeah, you'll see it on the ground too. You'll see the white, my front um, my front porch, it rains, water kind of gets over there. You go out there, there's all this white stuff. Like all Got, yep, okay. Um, and then the last thing is the obvious one, staining, right? If something stained, yeah. obviously something stained it. So that's it. Those five things. If you literally just went through your house and looked for these five things, you would be able to find so many problems that you wouldn't think about. Yeah. And that's that's basically what we do. We didn't, like simplify it too much, but that's like, yeah, it's like no, what we do. And, and I love the practicality of like even a uh, leak under your sink because who hasn't had that? Um, so what's the next step? I mean, uh, tell us about first of all this is one thing I really want to highlight because right before the show, I knew that you guys were all over the U S and able to really go anywhere people needed you, but tell me just a little bit about your process because it's very unique. And I think it's the future of mold remediators because what I find is someone will call me from Illinois or from Florida, or, and they'll say, who do you know in this area, Jill? Well, the likelihood of me having someone that I trust in that area is very low. <laughs> um, so we, we always go to people like you, but tell us again about your process because it uh, covers everywhere and it's very unique. Yeah, it was interesting. It's it all started because we were going to these like conferences that we talked about four or five years ago, and honestly before that too. But we started to get referrals from doctors all over the country. And at the time, we were based in we had an LA branch and kind of a New York branch, and that was it. And there's just so many people calling now. Like now, we're actually speaking at the conferences. All of a sudden, like everybody comes in, and so myself and and uh, my business partner Corey. Um, we basically looked at our family business, which is what this is, and said, okay, how can we basically expand this to figure out how to service more people? The big challenge, which we totally felt and we didn't want to miss, which is what you're saying, is that if you're not there, mm -hmm. you're going to miss stuff, right? Like you have to be there in some way. You can't just have somebody walk around the house with a yeah. Facebook Live and think you're going right. to you know, see exactly. stuff, right? Exactly. And so we basically, I don't know if I ever told this story before, the, when we first started doing this, there was, um, there's this cool technology that, um, that news crews use, like news remote vans when oh, they yeah. go and do like TV shows. So basically they have like a pack that has different um, broadcasting things in it. So there was one that we got that had six different cellular phone company signals that was built into it. Mm -hmm. That pack beamed out to like a satellite and then the satellite beamed back to a home base which would be like the production studio basically and that's how they did like live remotes for like news things and so my Corey and i are like why don't we just strap this backpack to somebody and put a camera on their arm and do inspections like this and so that was actually how it started right so we literally had a guy that went out put a gopro on his wrist attached him to this broadcasting equipment and we were going with him through the house no look closer here put the yeah. camera like this do yeah. this do that and that was the first iteration really of what, of what the house wow. all yeah. happened. Um, and since then we've developed you know apps and things around it to make it a lot easier but we basically fly someone to wherever the location is so if it's in the middle of North Dakota, where you have to drive three hours after an airport, that's where they go. Mm -hmm. They're there in person. And then you have somebody on the back end, like myself or one of our senior consultants that are basically working with them to go through the process to make sure that we're, you know, yeah. not missing stuff. Wow. That's like I said, this is, I think the future, because we do have this need for people who are knowledgeable like you um, and your team. Uh, with our patients, because most of the time, this is the missing piece of me helping people get well. Um, I think like your first experience and mine too, they do an air sample and they're like, everything's fine. Now, just to be clear, and I'd love for you to talk about this. I'll just tell my opinion. Air sample is not bad. It's one piece of data. I think it's a part of a thorough investigation, but what we find is the spores don't often, especially really toxic hidden molds, they're not in the air, very high quantities. Um, so often you miss that. It looks pretty good. So what's your yeah. thought about the testing and kind of the realm of what you would like to see to really make sure besides a good inspection, because what you just said is actually the number one thing. It's the brain that's actually thinking about what's going on here and not just the sampling, because I've had many patients. Um, we had one inspector, everything's fine, two, three, four, and on the fifth or sixth, they find a massive issue that everybody else missed. Yeah, it's so common too. a lot of the stories that people we work with don't necessarily find us right away. It kind of comes through that same yeah. thing. So I'm the, the testing thing, it's you're a hundred percent right. First off, you have to know where you're testing, right? You could use the best test that's ever been created in the wrong place. 
yes. and they'll tell you nothing, right? Correct. And so I, I kind of equate what we do to, to kind of what you do, right? The home is a living system. There's not one test that you would run to tell you everything is happening in the body. And the same thing is for us, for the house. Different tests have their strengths and weaknesses. Our goal is to understand the strengths and the weaknesses, where are the gaps in an air sample, which I'll talk about in a second. And then how do we fill those gaps with other tests? And then how do we tell like a really full, strong story and understand what's going on? So the thing with air sampling, I bash air samples a lot, but then you have to caveat it about like, well, it's not everyone, but you know, every, but you have to get this across. An air sample in the middle of the room is a complete waste of time. It's just a complete waste of time. There's a lot of reasons for this. It's a snapshot in time. It doesn't account for everything you talked about. So we had kind of known this. So for a year while we were out in the field, I just did this internal study just so I could reference something when I yeah. talked to people. So if I thought there was mold in this wall, let's say there was like one of the five signs we yeah. talked about this wall. So I would do a cavity test inside of this wall, right. which means little hole in the wall, tube through the wall, test behind the wall, see what's actually at the source mm -hmm. level. I would then stand right about here, which is about three steps away and do an air sample pump at breathing level to understand my air quality. 80% of the time when there was something here, this said nothing. Yes. So that is, that's the problem with air sampling. So th the problem is it gets exponentially less effective the further away from the source you get. Mm -hmm. Now the pro of air sampling is if I'm at this wall and there's no mold growing on the front of it, how would I know that it's back there? There's no way to know that it's back there. So the closer you get to source, what air sample does for you is it allows you to actually get a better picture of what's going on when there's not something on the visible surface from a mold piece, right? So if you can get as close to source as you think that it is, do an air sample there in an isolated space or in a wall cavity, it's actually the best test that you can use mm -hmm. for identifying source when there's no surface growth somewhere. So it at the same time, it could be the best option of a test you can use and be the absolute worst option of a test you can use, depending on where you're using it. Mm -hmm. I love that because I agree. I think there is a place um, and time absolutely for good air samples. And again, knowing, but you have to have a brain behind the thought process of where you're looking. Just like you said, those first the five sample or the five hidden sources, you yeah. have to somebody who really knows what they're looking for, because that's the key is not just cameras and fancy gear and air sampling. It's the mind, it's just like what I do too. It's like that detective work that we do to figure out where the source is. So I really like that. The other thing yeah. I, I want to mention, I mentioned this before and you well know this, but in the air, typically those large spores, what we, what, a lot of things that make us sick are these VOCs, these volatile organic chemicals or compounds. And those compounds, um, we froze for a second, but I think we're good. Oh, okay. We're, here? I heard we're, everything. All good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I kept talking. So <laughs> uh, what I was going to say is those, those volatile organic compounds, which are the toxins that are produced by mold, number one, are usually causing more illness in the patient. Number two, that's not what we're testing in air samples or even cavities. So sometimes the mold is behind there producing some really nasty toxins and that's in the air. It's invisible. It's like a fume. And we're testing for spores, which are not readily available in the air. So that can be part of the difference too. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like, and in addition to that, the spore if, is such a small, it's so funny. Like we all know mold spore, such a small piece of the equation at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Yeah. The fragmentation that breaks off of the mold colonies are way more problematic than the actual spore that's coming off. They're so much smaller in size mm -hmm. and there is such more higher amount than spores. So for example, if you had, you could have a fragment load that's two, three, 500 times more the amount of load of spores that you find in a single space. So let's say you found five store spores of Sacubatria somewhere and you get, I've literally seen some of the specters like, ah, that's not that bad. It's fine. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal. That five spores of stack could mean mycotoxins are coming off that you're not identifying. It could mean that the, the fragment load that's moving out of that wall could be 500 times five, yeah. right? So right. now you're talking 2,500 fragment off of that. I mean, there's just so many other pieces of that. But the thing that, that you kind of like spurred with me when you said that is, is the concept of like what a real inspection looks like right? And how you're kind of looking for those things. The source is super important because mm -hmm. it's, it's where it's coming from. So I use this analogy all the time that the mold's like a factory, right? So like if you're driving down the road, there's a factory off the side of the road. You can't see what they're making inside. There's walls around the factory, yeah. right? But smoke is coming out of the top of the factory. That's the byproduct of whatever's being made inside, right? And so let's say you live in this house, like a half mile away and you walk outside and you're breathing this air pollution because you're so close to it, right? Now, some people might say, oh, man, you live in it. You have an air pollution problem where you live. 
I mean, kind of, but not really. You have a factory problem where you live, right? If the factory goes away, the air pollution is no longer getting created. The problem is the air pollution is the toxins and the fragments and the VOCs and everything you're talking about. So that's more the exposure that's happening, but the source is where it's coming from, right? So you have to know the source in order to stop that production from happening. But then we have to know what's the composition of the dust and the fragmentation throughout the house that is getting resuspended in our breathing zone that does account for mycotoxins and bacterial toxins and all these things. Yeah. So we can, we can clean it the right way. We can understand how we have to address the whole thing. So there's kind of two pieces to this equation. It's source factory creation. And then it's like dispersion and cross-contamination that's moved through the house. And say so probably the biggest mistake I see in both inspections and remediation is that they only focus on the first thing and they're not even really good at it. Yeah. Like, oh, well, the source is like right here. Let's rip this thing out. We're all good. Yet everything that's spread through the house and possibly into your air conditioning system and all these other things, that's all still there. You walk back into your house after you drop 10, 15 grand on remediation, you're still sick. Yes. And you think remediation doesn't work. I got to yeah. burn my house down. The Facebook groups are right. And yeah. it's not true. It's just. Oh, you're just describing um, a <laughs> case that I recently dealt with where there was like 36 ketomi. It was significant. We had someone come in, re he had someone come in, remediate, and then. Um, Gosh, I think the number went up to 56 after. And again, it was just the cleaning after that was really the issue. And I think yeah. there was an additional source they found too. Um, so part of this, I think even giving remediation a bad name or like uh, one of the things a bunch of people had said were like, oh, you're getting ripped off. Well, that's not necessarily true, but a good remediation is hard to find. And also it costs what it's worth. Like you pay more to get yeah. the really good cleaning. So let's talk, I've talked about this before too, but I think it's so worth repeating. First of all, um, the old ERMI, I don't even use that term. I use QPCR, but one thing that I can do for patients before they get inspection or during or with that is say, okay, do a QPCR. It's not going to be the end all be all, but I do feel like getting that. It's what, so for anyone listening, QPCR, all it is is a dust sample of, of the dust in your home that is tested for DNA, uh, PCR DNA testing of the mold. So you kind of get a, a, a snapshot of what might have been in your home before or currently. It's not perfect. It doesn't tell you source. You still need an inspector like Brian, but the key there I find is I can look at those. And if there's like 20, 30, 40 of stack your ketomium. I know there's a, even if there's five, like you said, I know there's yeah. probably an issue. And then I'll say, okay, now you need to really get someone in there and find the source. What's your thoughts on that as maybe just a screening tool? Again, it's not perfect, but any thoughts on uh, QPCR? A hundred percent agree with you. It is, it has the strengths and weaknesses, just like anything else in terms of under. So we talk about where air samples miss out, right? They don't understand fragment load. They don't, they don't actually get the full load of what's going on. It, it really under reports a lot of yeah. times. Yeah. ERMI or PCR or whatever, it's the same thing. It's, it's going to show you that fragment load in the dust reservoir. So there's research papers out there about how to look at houses <laughs> that basically say you have to be looking at the dust settlement in a house. If you're truly doing an evaluation of what's going on in a house, because everything settles down in the, into the dust yeah. and that's how our re-exposure happens. So, so if you ever watched like Charlie Brown as a kid and there was like pig pen, the dirty kid, he always had this cloud of dirt around him. That happens to us as we walk around our house everywhere. It's yeah. called the human cloud effect, except you can't see it, but you sit down on your stuff, you bump your tables, whatever, all this gets popped up. That's your direct pathway to exposure and re-exposure and re-exposure. So I agree with you. I, I actually, like even beyond what you said, I agree with you so much that it's a great screening test that we actually developed an interpretation around how to look at them Love it. because you're right. The ERMI score, and this is why you're calling it PCR. Yeah, that's the exactly ERMI, right. <laughs> yeah, the ERMI score is crap. And I think mm -hmm. anyone, anyone who knows anything about it knows that yeah. if you actually got a hold of the original ERMI study that was done by the EPA, which took me five years to get a hold of, by the way, I feel like they're trying to hide it. Wow. I couldn't <laughs> find it. Um, it says in the study, just alone, without super getting into all the ifs and stuff yeah. about it, it literally says in there, the score has a plus or minus standard deviation of three. Oh. So that's there. <laughs> like, so yeah. now you see, you know, you have to have a two in your house for it to be a healthy house. I obviously yeah. don't agree with that. I know a lot I of people agree. don't, but you see that number everywhere because of where it came from. So everybody's honing on, it needs to be a two, it needs to be mm -hmm. two. Well, guys, that two is no different than a five and it's right. no different than a negative one. So that one score can be in a super great house or an awful, awful house, all on the same scoring system. It's crap. It doesn't mean anything. But the technology behind Data it is, is so good, right? Yeah. 
And actually in our reports, I wonder if we started doing this at the same time, we'll put ERMI, but we put slash MSQPCR in it, like, because we're not like 100, 100. Like, what I found is I would be, I would call ERMI because if I go to most of the sites that our patients are ordering them from, um, they, it still says ERMI. So to tell the patients what to do, but then when they would talk to the inspector or someone who knows what you and I know, they're like, oh, ERMI is terrible. Are they, and I, and, and so it would, it would actually question my, uh, um, you know, advice for them to do that. So I started saying, no, 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 this is not because I don't believe in the ERMI, but I do know how to look at those scores and tell them yeah. what they need to know based on some of those toxic molds. And I really, obviously, like you do too, weight some of the more toxic molds heavier so I could get five or, or maybe even a four, which doesn't even score points on if I'm scoring hurts me's, right. but I still am like, I'm not sure this is safe. We don't know yet, but we need to look deeper. Yeah, and, and the interpretation is interesting, right? So the score is kind of all over the place. The way they do the math doesn't make sense. So yeah. like we would see these come in and you would have a score that was really high, let's say, but then when you looked at it, it actually didn't look that bad because yeah. of how the math worked. And on the flip side, you'd have a score that looks really low, but the overall load in the house was just astronomical, yeah. but the score was really low. Yeah. And so it was just super confusing. And so something that we wanted to do, we spent like eight months on this last year. So okay. went through every inspection we did for the last three years, because mm -hmm. we do armies at the uh, site, yeah. but we're also doing source testing. How many sources? So this is your army test you did in the house. How many sources were in this house? Was there mycotoxins in this house? Was there bacterial issues? It all tied back to this ERMI that we could compare wow. to. We went through, we looked at over 4,000 samples across those three years that we did. And we actually figured out a way to interpret ERMI in a way that gives you some sort of contextual relevance of what's actually going on in your house. Because wow. the reason that, that people do ERMI is at the end of the day, they're doing them because they kind of want to have an idea on like, my house an issue is not it's truly yeah, a screen yeah, test, right? exactly that's exactly what i feel and for me it's like if i see a massive load of something that i find in their urine and i actually match it i'm like oh, okay this fits the data that i'm collecting go call someone to help you so we never yeah. stop there but it's just the other thing i find if someone's buying a house or renting and they don't have a lot of options to go deep like in our market nowadays sometimes they can do an ERMI and get, you know, a little bit of data before they put down the deposit on a home. hundred, hundred percent. Totally. Totally. I've had people that do that too. The problem is that not everyone has you or me to look at their stuff. Right. Yeah. So then they get these things and they don't know what it is. So by kind of, we kind of like figured out an algorithm to go through. And when you did it and you sorted it by this new sort of kind yeah. of ranking system we created, when you did a sort, all of a sudden it was less mold sources in the house, less, less, more, 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 all the way down. And it actually made sense for what we were finding in the house. So we ended up calling it the ERMI code because we felt like we cracked oh, the code ERMI. I love uh, it. <laughs> and so uh, we put it, it's at ermicode.com. So it's a way to interpret your ERMI. So you still run your ERMI. And then it's 27 bucks. We made it really cheap for people to get into. You put all your ERMI information in, it immediately compares it to our entire yeah. um, you know, analysis database and it tells you where you fall. You can expect nine sources of mold growth in a house on average with, that looks like mm -hmm. this. All of a sudden that's information that's usable. I'm looking to get a new house. Yeah. I run an ERMI as a screen. And this says, oh man, with ERMIs like this, I could expect nine areas that I basically need to remediate in this house. Wow. Maybe I don't wanna do this one, mm -hmm. right? Um, or if you're looking in your own house and you're trying to decide, do I invest in a full inspection? Is there even a problem? Now you do it. You're like, oh, there's a, there's 12 sources on average in this house. And on average, mycotoxins were found 20% of the time in here. I think we really need to dive this, right? And that's the breakdown that we basically created out of all of the data from all the samples we did to try to put some like real context to what these very like confusing ERMI tests yeah. are, you know? Oh, I love that. I did so, not even yeah. know. That's tremendous. So ermicode.com. Yeah. Yeah. It's super easy. You just enter every, you know, just directly in the order, yep. everything that's entered on your ERMI, you pop it out and immediately tells you like where you fall and what your expectation looks like. Oh, well done. I didn't, this is fantastic. Great. information. <laughs> I love it. Cause again, it's super practical. And again, I see patients, I can interpret theirs, but there's a, you know, just like you, there's probably five, hundreds and even thousands more that don't, aren't able to see me and they have, you know, they have questions. So this is a great, great resource for them. Um, what else have we not covered that, that are common questions and problems that you see? We've covered a lot already. Any other little tips or tricks or things that? I mean, so we talked about the signs of stuff. So if people want to go, just do this right when you get off. Literally go through your house. Mm -hmm. Open yeah. up every sink cabinet that you have. 
pull everything out of your sink cabinets and look and see if you see any of these things that we talked about. Is there any bubbling in the bottom? Is there discoloration? Is it warped? Is it cracking? Odds are there's at least house that look like this finding something in your house and this is kind of the first thing that it's just so common right but just because it's common doesn't mean it's okay it just means that it happens a lot so we need to be more like hyper aware of that stuff not like diminishing of it you know um but, but that's like a super easy thing i think the thing to keep in mind is like understand that these problems come from water issues, but the water issues don't have to be big water issues. They don't have to be floods like we think about, right? So if we kind of reframe how we're looking at these like water events in the house, we could be a little more aware of where issues might be. And then, and even that issues might be getting created and we can start kind of being a little more proactive in how we handle ourselves and how we decide how to move forward. So the easy thing is if you go through and see a couple of things or your doctor's telling you, I always say this too, if your doctor's telling you that you're being exposed to mold and they're seeing it in the clinical test, believe them. I think like their tests are showing what they're showing for a reason, right? So I think it's important to, you know, to understand that component of it and not push back on that. And then you could always do an ERMI, kind of what you said is a screen. You could process the ERMI code if you want to and get a sense of what it means and ease yourself in to what this process looks like. So you feel really comfortable with, with kind of where you're going and, and have some uh, validation behind it. Yeah. And I want to repeat, you cut out for just a second. And you said, if your doctor says there may be mold, listen to them. I love that. I want to I'll say that again. So everybody can hear me. If your doctor's telling you that you have a mold problem, you have a mold problem. All right. Like they're running these tests. They're seeing it in your body. They're not making it up. And we just think, oh, my house is clean. There's no mold anywhere. Like, listen, if they're seeing it, it's probably there. And, and instead of like pushing back, I think you should maybe like, you know, put some faith in the people you chose to, to, to help you, you know? Oh, and I want to frame that on the other side, because um, a lot of you, uh, Brian and I work in the world of ICI and EHS and some of these organizations that train doctors and remediators and inspectors um, to really understand the illness. And, and I'm part of that teaching. So is Brian, but there's a lot of doctors out there that I think some of you in the chat, even today were saying, well, my doctors doesn't even believe that mold can cause illness. So on the other side, if you believe that you are sick from your home and you think that you suspect mold might be an issue, find someone, find a doctor, find an inspector like Brian to help you because this is treatable. Uh, it's complex, but it's very treatable. And the worst thing is for you to be suffering and ill and think that there's an issue and not have someone to help you. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, we obviously don't have time to get into it, but the 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 emotional and sort of psychological effect of all this stuff. I mean, it's hard. It's really, really hard. I think the point of all this is, while it's hard, it's doable, right? Yes. It's not like this death sentence, you know, that you're dealing with. It's very doable. Yes, and you and I are are living proof because <laughs> we've both been through it and and on the other side. Um, right. Awesome, awesome information. I think we're going to have to do part two because there's there's more to talk about. Um, well, tell, tell everybody where. So first of all, ERMI code, if you want to check the ERMI, but where can people find you? Where can they consult with you? Tell us where to find you. Yeah, so so our company, uh, company is We Inspect. That's my company name. So our website is yesweinspect.com. Um, if you're interested in inspections or anything like that, we basically have a form to fill out, give us some information kind of about your situation, and we can you know start the process there. Um, the other good spot is, you know, Instagram, probably, you know, I put out a lot of stuff there. It's very easily accessible. Um, I also have a special phone that I have specific for people to text me on. So a whole nother story I can talk about another day, but you could get that number from Instagram. You could text into the phone. I do my best. I carve out like 15, 20 minutes a day to try to answer people on text lines. So I try to try to do what you can, you know, but, um, but we get there. I think, I think the big takeaway is that the ERMI code piece, I think is really important for people. And then, you know, obviously if, if you, you want to talk with us some more, we're around. You are, and you're putting, like I said, you're putting out great content. So kudos to you. It's so needed. I so appreciate you and I appreciate your time today. And like I said, we'll have to schedule a part two. I love it. Thank you so much.